Language interfaces are going to be a big deal. That's how Sam Altman, chair of OpenAI, put it when they launched ChatGPT last November. Going to be a big deal? Definitely a big deal. Hello, I'm Christopher Keneally with CCC, and at the 2023 Frankfurt Book Fair, the halls are alive with the sounds of AI. At the Frankfurt studio, I'm going to be moderating a panel on why machine solutions should make way for human concerns over authorship and authenticity. I have a wonderful panel, and I want to uh, uh, briefly introduce them now. Uh, immediately to my right is Carlos Colo Labazari. Carlo, welcome. Thank you. He's an internationally recognized specialist in intellectual property law and policy with 20 years of experience working in Africa, Europe, and the U.S. He's the author of a short paper, a snapshot of the relationship between AI, copyright, and licensing, which is available uh, today at, at, at this event. Uh, to Carlo's right is Dr. Namrata Singh. Dr. Namrata, welcome. Thank you. Dr. Namrata is founder and director at Turica's Group, a medical communications company working with pharmaceutical, biotech, medical device, and diagnostic firms, as well as academic institutions to support research and publications globally. Uh, Dr. Namrata is a pediatrician and a founding member of the AI Working Group at the European Medical Writers Association. And on the far end, at the, uh, to my right, is uh, Dr. Hong Zhu. Dr. Hong Zhu, welcome. Dr. Hong Zhu is Director of Intelligence Services and Head of AI R&D for John Wiley & Sons and leads the Intelligence Services Group in Wiley Partner Solutions. Uh, Dr. Zhu holds a PhD in 3D modeling with artificial intelligence algorithms, and he's a chef and contributor to the Scholarly Kitchen blog published by the Society for Scholarly Publishing. And I think, Dr. Zhu, it's important to, to start with you and to learn more about the publisher's perspective here and how these tools are going to become part of your workflow. And tell us about the role that AI solutions will play in, in this intended evolution at Wiley from being a content provider to being a knowledge provider. That's a good question. So basically, Wiley is a shift from the content provider to knowledge provider. So we start thinking about the, we talk about the, uh, when we talk about knowledge, so what mean knowledge? So the people, the consume or digest or the absorb the knowledge and understand, apply knowledge. And the knowledge is distributed to the people. So there's a clearly three key elements, people, knowledge, and how you interact it, distributed or to understand. So we apply the AI to, you know, to support in these uh, three, to support these three key elements. For example, the uh, knowledge. When we talk about knowledge, first we need to create knowledge. How? We need, you know, the, we, we apply the AI to automatically extract this uh, key metadata and to, to present the knowledge in the, you know, the user for the human friendly, human readable or machine and machine readable. And also, we extract the knowledge, the hidden knowledge, the valuable you know, concepts, entities, and relationship between the entities from this unstructured text content. So this is a knowledge creation. And then in order to better to serve the people, we need to understand who they are and what their interests so that we can the, you know, distribute the relevant the articles and the knowledge to them, to human. So we apply the AI to understand perhaps uh, the, our publisher or partners to better understand who their audience, what they want, what's their interests, what's their expertise. So we can you know, the, make sure we can make the person more personalized the, you know, the information distribution to them. And the, the lastly, we also want to, you know, the, how, to how can we the, help the researchers, user to discover, discover this uh, knowledge because today is the over information overloading is is too much to to read, so we need you know to apply the AI to simplify it to generate the summarization to help. And the for example the our the Wiley have the you know the uh, Wiley Partner Solution have the you know the research you know exchange submission, so we automatically extract the metadata to make the submission work is much easier, and also we have the literatum the largest the digital publishing platform for the content, for scholarly content in the world. And then we can enable and make the, all this the knowledge is searchable and readable over the internet. So this is, and also we, we also the validate the knowledge because this is very important integrity. 
is as a publisher is a key responsibility to make sure the, the this uh, public you know the knowledge are in the good quality good standard so we also apply ai to detect is the paper mills image manipulations etc Right, and, and it seems to me that in order to understand uh, the, the, the where publishing will be going using these AI tools, it, it's important to understand how people are using them. And it sounds to me like it's changing the relationship to two relationships, really, the relationship of the, the researcher to the content, but it's also changing the relationship of the researcher, the authors, to the publisher. Ex exactly, exactly. So this is a change the whole of the research the experienced with this content, especially in the generative AI. So now, for example, normally we consider the uh, four main roles of the researchers, right? authors, researchers, and also editor and the reviewers. This is normally the, the, you know, the roles. And then the, all this AI, so actually this is not only the content, but also the AI powered the solutions to change the, this uh, people, this role's experience. For example, for author, you know, the AI, generative AI, now you can use to the polish, you know, the, and help them to the draft the manuscript and the polish, the, you know, the writing to increase the writing qualities, et cetera. Especially useful for the whose native language is not English. So this is actually, this is the most the popular generative AI application in the world now. And for the researchers, we can apply the AI to to identify the ways how to improve the manuscript, and the and the also the, for the for the reviewers, yeah, identify the you know the ways to improve the reviewers and the quality, and also is and then help the reviewers to quickly see oh there's any support or contradicting you know the literature in this, and also for editor we can apply the AI to identify you know the the is there any the relevant reviewers you can review this and identifies any emerging you know, the journal opportunities, new opportunities. For researcher, lastly, I believe you know, the, the AI will be the, every researcher in the future will have the, you know, the personal research assistant to help them, you know, not only the discover information, you know, the think, apply the information, and remember this information knowledge, but also they can, this AI, especially the AI agent, it can help them to you know the plan and the execute and analysis the exper experiment, so the definitely the, you know this will speed up the research outcome. And, and as as the content grows, I mean content is going to grow because for a lot of reasons there are going to be more authors who are enabled to submit to the journals, but also AI content is going to be part of the growth as well. What kind of concerns does that raise for you at Wiley around copyright issues and 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 the copyrighted content? And I associate the copyrighted content with quality content because it's content that's been curated, peer-reviewed, and, and, and there's an element of trust that's part of it. Yes, indeed. So, so, so now the current status situation is, you know, the AI governance is far behind the AI, you know, the capabilities, which is dangerous. And then the, it's very difficult, it actually it's impacts the, you know, the, the research and also the publishing. Because it's very hard, you know, the for the people to manage all this, you know, the this uh, AI capabilities, and then you know the so that's why you know the we need you know the create the legal framework, and to catch up this the technologies to have the response. So it, I do have the several concerns about this. So first concern is everyone know is you know the and the copyright infringement. So is uh, today is a copy, you know, the AI, generative AI uh, use, you know, the the generate the, the content, which you know the infringe on the you know the copyright without permission. So this is a problem. This already is a lot of the suitcases, uh, you know, the over the internet. Even worse, you know, the recently the um, OpenAI and the Google they released, you know, the web crawler to allow the you know to automatically grab the information over the internet to, to train the model, to improve that model. Although, you know, they allow the users, the pub, uh, you know, website publisher, to, you know, to disable, to block this. But I think, you know, as the AI's the capability expand, the things is become much more complicated. So this is one concern. Another concern actually is uh, the AI can generate the content, which, you know, it's a, uh, 
it's similar to the you know the the original the content, but it's not that uh, enough to be considered as you know the copyright infringement. This is one scenario. Another scenario is you know, it's it generates some content, it's in, which infringes the copyright, but it's hard to detect. So in both cases, for the for the copyright holders, it's very difficult for them to enforce the right. In both cases. All right. Well, well Dr. Hong Zhu with Wiley, thank you very much. And, and I want to turn to Dr. Namrata because you've got an interesting perspective. You're creating content and you're working with um, many of the uh, research institutions as well as the pharmaceutical companies and others who are going to be submitting content to journals and, and uh, that uh, at Wiley and elsewhere. So as, as you do all of that work, what's your message for publishers about AI and content creation? Um, I, I think uh, what has happened is, as you mentioned, when uh, Chat GPT was launched, and you know that was the honeymoon phase in the initial part where everybody was that you know it's going to make life easier for, uh, especially content creators. But uh, what I have you know seen and what I have realized in last say eight to ten months, it has been it has put uh, an additional responsibility on the medical writers. It's just not, you know, the reduction of the time, which is important here. It is not only the efficiency, which we have to focus on, but also the the checking, the all the legal aspects, the integrity part of it, um, the copyright, as you know, uh, we we mentioned. So um, it's it's not a very, um, as to say, it's not a very um, a magic bullet kind of solution, but it is something which is there. We cannot ignore it. And the publishers also will have to acknowledge. So I, I did come across, you know, some instances where uh, people spoke about uh, that if it is an AI-generated content, then uh, should should it not be accepted, or you know, how do you differentiate? So I think that is where uh, more focus of the publishers should be. That even if it is an AI-generated content, is there a human being who was behind it and who kind of, you know? Uh, approved it, reviewed it, checked the authenticity of that content. So the human part um, is going to be there. In fact, um, even if the efficiency becomes better, the responsibility is becoming higher. Yeah. Mm, mm. So, you know, so the balance is and, and, and times to come and with the, all these, you know, developments happening and new technologies coming up, it's going to get, get more uh, tougher going forward. So it's not something which is going to maybe make life uh, very easy for the medical writers, but it's going to be, you know, you have to wade through that uh, ocean of tools which are out there and um, how much, and then the additional responsibility on you because uh, I, I've read about all these um, class actions and, you know, lawsuits and the writers may, may, may come in the center of all this because they are the ones who created the content. And when you're doing it, when you're writing it or when you are, you know, working with your clients, sometimes you are pushed to do things which you've, feel that which is you know which you should not be doing so we are not the ones who own the content so that's an additional responsibility on us to educate the client to you know tell the especially you know the sponsors the pharmaceutical companies look it's not so simple if even if it's an ai tool so you are not going to get a paper in say hours out of it so there is going to be you know some human interactions behind it and similarly for the publishers also well, I think that gets back to the point, Dr. Namrata, that, that, that Dr. Zhu was making about the importance of trust in content here and the challenge with a lot of the generative AI tools is the lack of transparency, yes. uh, the, 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 the lack of uh, identifying the sources, and, and that must be really troubling for writers because they do, as you say, have this yes. real responsibility. Yes, yes. And uh, a lot of guidelines and recommendations did come up over last uh, couple of months, so we had uh, ICMJ um, guideline came up, which mentioned about the responsibility of uh, authors and an additional responsibility. So even if uh, and the disclaimers and the transparency, if you have if you have used an AI tool, then you mention that in your method section. You mention the name of the tool. You mention the version if it is there or the whole technology part behind it. So this is where I guess the transparency works. But ultimately, the responsibility is on the author. And as we we write on behalf of the author, then you know the responsibility comes back to us. 
so but uh, guidelines and recommendations do help us uh, just to you know know that what is right and what is wrong and what what we can do and what we cannot do well, well you know i think what's coming through for me is just you know the 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 real responsibility this the sense of principle that is involved here and i want to pull back a second and let people know about your background you're a pediatrician i'm a pediatrician Right. So you have dealt with patients and you've worked with people yeah. who are at, at one of the most important parts of their lives. And, yeah. and many of the writers that you have are women, particularly yes. trained in medicine, yeah. who are you're trying to balance family and work and so forth. So yeah. this is this is deeply a part of what you do. It's not just the business part. Yeah. It's, a, it's your it's your uh, professional yes. concern. Yeah. So it is. And uh, and another uh, concern here is um, we have uh, people working from various locations and um, so the, the the technology part and the security part and the uh, and some somewhere the integration with the it and technology so all this is you know where everybody whether it's a small company or a large company i mm. guess that's where everything has to converge we cannot have it in isolation we cannot have a tool and just you know ask the team to implement and start working on it so we do a small experiment on various tools but that is only for an experiment sake where we are not working on the client projects or confidential data on that we uh, navigate these tools we see what are the advantages disadvantages how much of time uh, it is reducing or what is the productivity and we have certain parameters which we evaluate on those but that's a, that's a completely a research activity which we are doing internally and uh, there are very strict instructions to all the writers and we have the whole uh, IT um, uh, kind of you know, infrastructure also where they are not allowed to work on client projects yet. I was a journalist in my previous life and we always said consider the source. Yes. And it sounds to me like that's equally important yes. in your profession. Yes. Consider the source. Yeah, and, and there's one more uh, very, very important concern which is here. So the tools which are now, which are there, they have been trained on manually generated data till now. Now what's going to happen in next couple of years? So maybe uh, more AI-generated content is coming. Yeah. And then the training will be on those AI-generated content. And eventually maybe you know the quality of the content overall because everything is connected we are not working in silos here we are connected to so many you know various stakeholders so eventually if we don't have these uh, uh, rules and regulations in place then it might have a very serious impact on the research integrity itself and you know then what papers we are getting afterwards can we trust them do do we you know can we quote them as uh, as our references mm -hmm. So that might happen. Well, Dr. Namrata, thank you for raising those important points. And, and I want to turn finally to Carlo Lavazari. Carlo, welcome again. And um, you have contributed uh, to CCC uh, what uh, I'll call a white paper here, a brief paper on the snapshot of the relationship between artificial intelligence, copyright, and licensing. We have copies of this available for everyone here. And I, I guess I want to ask you a little bit, uh, because we, we, we assume a lot here when we hear about AI, and definitions are sometimes you know, crucial to this. What do we mean by this AI or that AI? Um, which technologies particularly are using copyrighted materials as the inputs for their solutions? Well, I mean, the, the, the models that have been catapulted in everyone's consciousness, and thanks for having me today, uh, are the large language models, the LLM, which is maybe one instance of a so-called foundation model, which is a broad general application AI uh, tool, and typically those are trained on be it structured or unstructured inputs of enormous proportions, some really fantastical numbers, um, and are, are trained to be of a general application. They are then sometimes enhanced by what I would call specific libraries to make them more suited to perhaps medical writing or um, you know, fire regulation of buildings in architecture or whatever. Mm -hmm. So then you sort of specialize the general foundation model into the area you're interested in. All right. So, so what are the rights of copyright holders in relation to all of those uh, inputs and, and then to the outputs as well? Copyrights, I mean, there, there are two questions, the, the input side and the output side predominantly. Um, on the output side, I think it, it resolves along the line of similarity is the, 
are the works similar or is there a new right that maybe creative people need to protect their style but there's also freedom of expression that should put a limit to what you can protect I mean, if you want to emulate a famous writing genre, it would be a pity if this was somehow inhibited by overprotecting this kind of uh, similarity of writing style. On the input side, definitely, in order to make any valuable artificial intelligent tool, you will need entire reproductions of works that are scraped from the open internet or they are procured through special um purchases, I guess, licensing of uh, materials to use. I think in the previous panel we heard that open access um, titles are frequently used at Frontiers is doing that with uh, Google. So um, those are the source materials. They will still need to be processed, normalized in some fashion, because um, in order for, for the machines to work well, they do need either at the input sites structured data, or then they need a how shall I say, a calibration phase where whatever they learn from unstructured data is tested against labeled data. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if that answers. Very helpful. And, you know, at Frankfurt Book Fair, it's a, it's a global event, but it's important to remind the audience that copyright is a national issue. Can you briefly tell us about some of the responses in various jurisdictions to these questions that have been raised? And they're very new questions, so not everything is fully cooked at this point. But tell us where we're at. Absolutely. So uh, the the it's it's quite spotty. That's the very short answer. So you have copyright law being territorial. So it applies in whatever country legislates. And there have been a few countries that have made specific rules or are in the process of doing so. In the EU, there are extensive uh, rules on so-called text and data mining, and text and data mining for non-commercial and commercial purposes. Text and data mining isn't identical to AI, but there is a significant overlap mm -hmm. so that many people engaged in AI will at least deploy text and data mining as well. And so there are exceptions and opt-out mechanisms that allow you in some circumstances to use text as input in the non-commercial sphere especially, um, even though software, for instance, isn't included there, only li like wor literary works, let's say, articles, books. Mm -hmm. Um, on the commercial side, there is an opt-out possibility for materials available on the open internet in the EU. So that's a very specific rule. In the meantime, the EU is busy legislating a so-called AI Act and is addressing what was said earlier, the transparency requirement, especially for foundation and generative AI models. So the AI Act that is expected to go through, but who knows, in December, would ultimately include an obligation to disclose what copyright protected works have been used to train these generative models. And I do think it is an important marker to force greater transparency into these models. China has gone, if I may add this also, has gone out of its way to create 15 principles, I think around the 15th of September. 18. 18th of September, this has come into law okay, in other three days. Yes. Uh, and those are, are they are principles, but they are pretty mandatory. And in, as part of the principle is, in fact, transparency as to labeling of data and also what, what data has and respect for intellectual property rights. Right. I, I, I've heard people compare the AI Act uh, that's uh, in, the, in the European Parliament right now to, to a kind of a GDPR for, for AI, that if it were to come into effect in the EU, it would have an influence globally. That, that, that is predicted um, in the sense that any significant AI giant or, or business or in publishing, people really publish for the world or these AI entities are developed for the world. So to ignore a segment of a four or five hundred million people in, uh, in, in Europe is, is going to be hard. Similarly, 1.3 billion people in China, it's going to be hard to ignore and say, ah, oh, we're just not going to deploy our, our tools in those jurisdictions. I don't think many com companies would consider that an option. And, and as we've heard from, from Dr. Zhu and Dr. Narada, there's going to be a great demand uh, not only to uh, use the tools, but to have materials to keep feeding the tools. And so 
That is a, a, a real challenge. What kinds of licensing would meet that demand? Can you tell us? As he was said earlier, there's an IBM sort of short video that you know says AI is big on productivity and on performance, but it's it's low on on, on trust and um, and and transparency. So the, these licenses um, can either be from segments of publishing, perhaps that have large content that they can license or it could be a collective license where a agency such as CCC is used to deal into situations of linking many to many situations so you have many writers many publishers on the one side you have many pieces of content on the other side used by different AI tools so that is one mechanism is collective licensing I think the, the, it was said in a U.S. submission to the Copyright Office that the key of copyright is credit, attribution, consent, and compensation. And these type of licenses are well suited to handle consent, credit, and compensation. Yeah, yeah, there's one more point I'd like to ask you about, and, and maybe the others can, can help us with this too. We talk about content all the time. I'm a writer, so I think content means words. But in scholarly publishing, content means images. It means yes. data. It means all of these things. Is, is that what we're talking about? All of that comes under the umbrella of copyright, of course. A, a large segment thereof is in copyright material. So many, many images, photos, uh, illustrations in scientific articles are subject to copyright. There will also always be data that's not data, uh, raw data that is not subject. In fact, the EU again has legislated in a Data Governance Act and has specifically excluded sensory data from any protection. So when your fridge says to the supermarket in future, you're out of milk, that type of data is, is not going to be suddenly engulfed in, in this discussion about how to uh, relate uh, in copyright content to, to the AI endeavor. Yeah, I can just add one more point Please build on this. So I think the AI is now move from the more analytic AI to the generative AI, from the single modality to the multi-modality. So AI and also the, you know, this uh, rich, you know, the research outcome like images, videos, and the text is, uh, you know, is a uh, correlated, positive correlated because, you know, the and the AI can be used to generate this rich, you know, the research output, images. AI can be used to generate videos, generate text, and even the virtual reality in the future. But on the other hand, you know, the, this rich, you know, the research outcome can be used to feedback to the AI to build an even better model. Hmm. So this is kind of the loop. I'll leave with some advice. It's always important to use your own judgment and common sense and to verify information from multiple sources before making any important decisions or taking any actions. It's great advice, and you can take it. It came from ChatGPT, <laughs> all right? <laughs> I want to thank our panel, attorney Carlos Scola Lavazari, Dr. Namrata Singh, founder and director of Tour Coast Group, and Dr. Hong Zhu, director of intelligence services and head of AI R&D, for Wiley. Thank you all very much indeed. My name is Chris Canelo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.